That's good. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> This Pottery's piece was brought to the show by our guest and was made by the 1970s by Laddie Qualley, who's a Nigerian potter, ceramicist, and educator. The guest purchased the pottery when she was in Nigeria in the late 1970s. Lady Qualley's pottery was highly regarded among African pottery due to the distinctive incised work that characterized her pieces. This particular pottery carries incisions of various animals, fish, and plants. Also, there's a mixture of brown and green glazes spread all over the pottery, which aids its vibrancy. The appraiser valued this piece at approximately eight to ten thousand dollars. Wow! Wow! Blows my mind. <laughs> really? Oh! This Japanese lacquer writing box was brought to the show by the guest. It was originally purchased by the father of the guest's friend. The writing box and table were made in 1900, with the box consisting of ink, cake, and several lacquer brushes. The piece was manufactured with beautiful decorations of sky, waves, and other interesting decorative diagrams that was collaboratively done by silversmith, lacquer experts, and other artists. A purchasing receipt of about $2,200 was found with the box, indicating of its value in 1966. However, times have changed, and there's not much interest in Japanese lacquer writing boxes presently. But the extraordinary nature of this particular piece still holds value in the auction market. The appraiser valued this piece between ten dollars and $15,000. This is a tribal war club from an island in the Pacific. It's been a family for generation after generation. Yes, we come from a family of whalers. whalers. Yes, I believe that the tribal members would trade with the whalers when they came through, and that's how we actually acquired it. It's also a badge of high status for a warrior. This item is from the Marquise Islands in the Pacific. It's made of iron wood, or Kassirian wood, which is extremely hard and dense. And after they'd carved it, they would put it in the taro fields until it went black. This could take a long time. And then they would polish it with coconut oil. The marks on it quite often replicate the tattoos that they would have on their bodies. The club was made early 19th century. The head in Polynesia is also considered really important. The human head and this also is interesting. And this also is interesting that this is the head shape. And you even have small heads where the eyes are and the radiation is going up. Marquisa clubs are usually between four and a half and five feet long. It's a highly prized status symbol. And at auction, it's worth? Retail price would be between thirty and 40000 Oh, that's, that's pretty up there. Right. No, I would I never mean, have guessed that. This incredible family heirloom, a circa 1840 perfume bottle, was brought to the show by our guest. She inherited the bottle from her father, who kept it intact after it was passed down to him from previous generations. The perfume was made in France by Alexis Fels of House Genesette, the renowned French jewelry house famous for its claw sign enameling and Japanese-inspired designs. The perfume bottle was covered in turquoise jewels, while the top was made with French blue enamel, a distinct signature of the maker. The historical context surrounding the closure of the Genesette jewelry house after the revolution indicates that the perfume was likely made in the 1840s. Although it's hard to substantiate the maker due to the 18 karat French gold mark closure that covered the perfume. The gold is 18 karat because French jewelry is always 18, 18 karat. karat. However, every other indication points to it being a creation of Janisette, which explains its value in today's market. The appraiser valued this perfume at around $15,000. I guess brought three different items that have been touched and signed by the world's most renowned physicist, Albert Einstein. Her grandmother's sister, Lottie Neustein, had worked with Einstein's close friend, Dr. Gustav Bucky. The time that Bucky was working with Einstein to revolutionize x-rays, and Lottie Neustein was part of his team. Lottie had the privilege of having personal encounters with Einstein, and through their interactions, she gained these three memorabilia pieces. First was a letter addressed to Lottie from Einstein in 1942. The letter is written in German, and Einstein's distinct handwriting has made it quite challenging to translate. However, they are able to decipher that it was a thank note for some holiday candy that Lottie had sent to Albert. The second is a sketch that was used as a magazine cover in 1955 and was signed by Albert Einstein for Lottie's sister. The last piece is a signed copy of his autobiography, The World as I See It, released in 1949. For the letter, the appraiser was confident it would get five dollars to $6,000 in retail. The sketch would fetch a handsome three dollars to $5,000. The book would sell for five dollars to $6,000 because it was signed and contained a personal note bringing the total value of the items to thirteen to $17,000. Thank you so much. <laughs> Gifts are special, and in this case, it was both meaningful and valuable. 
Well, this gift Anne gave a gift to her mother worth $7,000. It was a beautiful perfume flask with Champlive enamel work, a rare find indeed. This beautiful perfume flask dates back to the mid-19th century. She died in 1958, and I think she was in her 90s when she died, and she started collecting antiques in 32. The flask was adorned with pearls on the shoulders, and there was a beautiful dragon-shaped top piece, too. And one can see from the side view how the hook operates that one would attach. The appraiser appraised the flask craftsmanship, noting its uniqueness and beauty. Made of 18 karat gold and estimated to be worth five to $7,000 at auction, the flask held a sentimental value for the guest family. Well, we've always loved it. My mother, like I said, wore it all the time. She brought in a collection of 47 posters that her late brother collected in the early 60s as a teenager. The collection includes iconic pieces like the Jimi Hendrix Flying Eyeball from 1968 by Rick Griffin. His brother would send money for postage to Bill Graham and the Fillmore West. In return, rediscovered after years of being stored under her mother's bed. With posters, condition is key. Every pinhole, tear, or tape mark can affect their value. And since the Jimi Hendrix Flying Eyeball, at auction with the Jimi Hendrix Experience at... This particular poster is $3,000 to $5,000. Yeah. And the Grateful Dead performing at Cafe Agogo in Greenwich Village. The first time they played in New York in 1967. And that one is around $2,000, $3,000. And surprisingly, all 47 the posters would auction at... At auction, <laughs> between twenty dollars and $35,000. <laughs> wow. wow. Holy moly. This pretty painting of flowers looks simple, but it's actually by a famous female artist, Fidelia Bridges. I believe it's Fidelia Bridges. The guest acquired this painting for a mere $35 to $45 bundled with DVDs and Tupperware at an estate sale in Phillipsburg, New Jersey, mm -hmm. about seven years ago. Fidelia Bridges, born in 1834, was more than an artist. Raised by her older sister after the untimely passing of her parents, she found her way from Salem to New York and eventually to art school in Philadelphia, studying under William Trost Richards. Known for his detailed seascapes and pre-Raphaelite style, believed in portraying nature truthfully, focusing on detailed depictions of foliage, plants, and trees. Fidelia Bridges learned this technique from him. And you can see in this particular piece that she has paid a great deal of attention to the blossoms of the flowers and so on. In 1892, Fidelia Bridges relocated to Canaan, Connecticut. Today, the painting value is estimated at... If this were being offered in a gallery, we would expect to sell it in the range of $15,000. <laughs> wow. Yeah. This is a vintage Fender Telecaster guitar brought in by the guest. This Fender Telecaster from 1953 is a symbol of Fender's innovation in electric guitar design. Fender was founded by Leo Fender. It revolutionized the electric guitar industry with iconic models like the Telecaster. The guests inherited this guitar from their grandmother, who was a string instrument teacher for over 40 years. Featuring the original black pickguard and see-through blonde finish, this Telecaster comes with its original hard shell case and Fender Deluxe amplifier. This was the original Telecaster color, which came in a transparent blonde hue. For such a rare piece, it is worth... You put the guitar and the case and the amplifier together and you probably have a package that could sell for at least $30,000 in today's market. The guest showcased a porcelain snuff bottle, a match striker and a vase. The snuff bottle and match striker were brought at an online auction for $75 and $100, respectfully. Meanwhile, the vase was purchased at a local auction for $200. The appraiser discussed each item in detail. The first one was a porcelain snuff bottle called Enamel Decorated Biscuit with little pierced sections. The second piece had marks on the bottom and was made of yellowed glass with beautifully carved decoration. The decoration here is quite beautiful. It's got a pair of dragons that are facing each other that are in an archaistic style. The Yark Yamanaka indicated it was from a major dealer in Chinese and Japanese antiques. However, there were a few little hairline cracks, which decreased its overall worth. The third one was a vase with a color called Claire de Lune and a six-character mark for the Yong Zenf period. The vase exhibited fine-quality potting and stimulating archaic bronze form. The overall worth of all three items together was about $22,000. Oh my gosh. You are kidding. Oh no, my gosh. it's wonderful. It's a great snuff bottle. The 
guest brought a signed baseball he inherited from his uncle to the show. The guest uncle was fortunate to have received the signed baseball from Honest Wagner. He was an American baseball shortstop who played 21 seasons of Major League Baseball from 1897 to 1917, primarily for the Pittsburgh Pirates. What made this remarkable is the rarity of finding a Honest Wagner signature on a baseball. Therefore, obtaining a signed Honest Wagner baseball is considered an investment grade item. The appraisal value of the item is $20,000. Yeah, really. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an investment grade item. All right, well, Beautiful thank you. Piece. She discovered a lithograph print titled The Outbreak of the Rebellion in the United States, 1861, wrapped in aged brown butcher paper and twine in her mother's attic. The print issued in 1865 depicts the outbreak of the Civil War from a northern perspective. Divided into two halves, the central motif features liberty, with a crack symbolizing the division caused by Southern succession. The left side portrays the accused inaction of President James Buchanan and the corruption of Secretary of War John B. Floyd. On the other hand, the right illustrates Union strength, led by President Lincoln and General Winfield Scott. The print intricately shows historical allegories, portraying the emotions and events of the era. Despite its historical significance, there is a potential undervaluation due to contemporary misunderstanding of allegorical art. And the appraiser values it at? So it's probably worth about twelve dollars to $1,400, which is a substantial amount. That chair was brought in by the guest, who had acquired it almost 17 years ago. The guest expressed her love for this particular chair, noting its depiction of the Art Nouveau style, which emphasized nature-inspired designs. The appraiser acknowledged the item as a perfect example of decorative art. The beautiful chair was very popular in the 19th century. However, it declined in popularity by 1910 with the rise of modernism. The appraiser then assessed the worth of this piece. As a single chair, it's worth about $3,000 to $4,000 in today's market. I paid 1000 so I think you three to four great. is good. I'm excited about it. This guest had no idea that the item he had left in a box for years was the most valuable thing he owned. It was a six-bottle crute stand made with Georgian steel and cut crystal. Created by Paul Stewart in 1805, the store was England's most celebrated neoclassical silversmith. He gained fame by making tableware and silverware sculptures specifically for royalty. His famous works include a copy made for British Admiral Lord Nelson to mark his victory in the Battle of the Nile. How much did the appraiser think this set was worth? The appraiser estimated this set to have a value of eight to twelve thousand dollars. The guest who suffered a recent heart attack was so happy to hear this that he feared he might have another heart attack. I'm shocked. I can't speak so smoothly now. <laughs> the guest bought an Autobahn print of peregrine falcons eating ducks from a friend for two thousand dollars in the eighties in New York. An original Havel edition featuring watermarked Watman paper and life-size birds. So it is an original. And you can see that his name is right down here, John James Audubon, who is the artist of it. Audubon's prints exemplify a masterful blend of artistry and ornithological precision, creating stunning visual narratives. The Aquatint, titled Aquatint by Robert Havel, Peregrine Falcon, is a hand-colored masterpiece by Robert Havel. Known as the Havel Edition, this print is the first edition that was created between 1827 and 1838. There were just 435 prints in Audubon's work, each containing 175 to 200 prints. This bird, the peregrine falcon, is a very wonderful bird. It's dramatic. His picture of the face is just incredible. Dead birds increase in value by two to three times. Given its extraordinary rarity, it should be priced higher. They can go for as much as $150,000. If you took out those dead birds, you're probably looking at a $60,000 print. He has showcased a toy barn that was made by his great-grandfather. It was a replica of a barn that was owned by his great-great-grandfather. The original barn stood behind the guest ancestors' meat market on Massachusetts Avenue. The appraiser identified it as likely built in the early 1890s. The barn featured cute little funky wooden horses and a chicken coop. The appraiser also admired its cupola. It displayed a great print and an interesting history, having resided in Indianapolis for years. Pledging to keep it within the family's history, the appraiser estimated its value to be... And a little barn house like this is probably in the three to $4,000 range. Wow. According to the guest, it's been in her husband's family for about three generations. It was supposedly made in Germany, but actually made in Austria and Vienna. And um, the mounts are silver, so it's uh, silver, it's oxidized, it's discolored with age. 
And this would have been made in Austria in the 1880s. It's a drinking horn. And Viennese enamels like this were produced in some quantities. It's not particularly rare, but the size is significant. So for today's market, the, for auction, it goes for... Auction, I would estimate it between $8,000 and $12,000. Wow. I had no idea it was worth that much. The guest acquired this from a consignment store a week after she first saw it and fell in love with it. It is modeled on an old Chinese bronze form. It was made as a food vessel for a wealthy official to be buried with him when he died. The original is called a Fu Bronze and was made between the 7th and 3rd century BC. Now this piece is a later copy. It actually even has the name of the vessel that it imitated as part of the inscription. The date says made in the 12th year of the reign of the Emperor Tongzhi. This piece on the current market would sell for? This piece on the current market would carry a pre-sale estimate of seven thousand to ten thousand dollars. You're kidding! I can hardly believe that. Yes. Oh my God. It belonged to the guest's husband, aunt, who passed away twenty years ago. And my husband was so interested in this that he really wanted this. It's a ticker tape machine. And what we're looking at here is it. It says very clearly it's a Western Union Telegraph Company, and it's a ticker tape machine. A close look, and you can see Edison's name in there with a patent number. Edison patented this machine in 1869. It's a great example of this machine. It dates back to early 20th century, 1920s or so. Condition is phenomenal with the original black tape to protect the glass from breaking along the side. It even has some of the ticker tape in it as well. It's quite a heavy machine and was made to keep up to date on these stock quotes. At auction today, based on condition, it would sell for... I'd probably put an estimate somewhere between $8,000 and $10,000. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's a fantastic. great machine. This is not just an ordinary yield traffic sign. The guest inherited it from his father, who came up with the sign for an assignment. And he came back to the class and made a presentation about what about eliminating most stop signs and putting up a yield, the right-of-way sign. This idea wasn't accepted at the time. However, in 1950, as a member of the Tulsa police, he cut out his own sign and put it up at the first in Columbia and Tulsa. And in the nine months after the sign was planted, it dropped down to zero. Over here, we see there's a slow kind of banner above this very sign. These are early renditions of the sign, dating back to the 1939 era. Here's what the appraiser had to say. It's just kind of neat to see how his brain is working, how the, the design of the yield sign came about. It's kind of a, an amazing find. At auction, this sign would sell for? I came around to a value on this of $6,000 to $8,000 at auction. Very good, thank you. It belonged to the guest grandparents who were very keen on collecting Native American artifacts. I do not know where it came from. She never really told us. He didn't know. It's quite old, 19th century, perhaps circa 1880. This piece is from the Zuni tribe. This is a piece of pottery made for the tribe, not made to be sold. It's made from the coil method. Where they roll the pottery into long coils, okay. turn it around, and squish it down with a okay. stone or a rag, right. and create the pot. In this case, they molded these frogs on top of that coil jar. It's called a frog bowl, or a kiva bowl, adorned with frogs, which are like magical creatures. A little puddle might develop on the Pueblo. Suddenly there are tadpoles mysteriously oh, right. appearing. Right, right. And within a very short time, these tadpoles turn into frogs. So this has to do with regeneration. A typical frog pot maybe has three to four frogs, but this has six. I'm sure intensified its power. Yes, that's a powerful little bowl. <laughs> it's a really nice pot, and very desirable with a value of... I would value this on a retail basis at about $5,000. Okay. This amazing piece was found by the guests in the garage of her parents' new home in 1971. The modeler, or the sculptor, was Isaac Broom. He moved from abroad to the province of Quebec. And then he came down here to this country, to the Trenton area, to work for the Otten Brewer Company. He was so successful that some of his pieces won prizes at the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia in 1876. These tiles were done at the end of the 19th century, when most of the tiles looked like the style, very classical figures. And Parthenia, which is her name here, was one of the water goddesses, a nymph and a naiad. She's in this lovely gray-blue color, which is very rare, and this makes her very special. 
and also something that we associate at this point with Isaac Broom's work. This beautiful brass frame was added later. At auction, it would sell for? I would probably put a price on it of about $1,000 to $1,200. Okay, oh, very good. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty good old lady picture, huh? <laughs> the guest brought a German mechanical item received from her late friend Jim. It just kind of creeps her out and reminds her of Jim. This is a German automation made in between 1898 and 1910. It plays music and it also moves. That's the definition of a mechanical. The woman in the video is older and typically her mouth moves. Turn it around, the key wind mechanism here unfortunately is not working. It's functional, the doll's eyes would move, simulating a tea drinking scenario. The heads are made of paper mache. At auction, this would bring in between $1,500 and $2,500. Okay, all right, thank you. Well, Jim would be happy to know That's that. Fine. This beautiful piece of pottery is a Van Briggle Lorley vase that was a gift from the guest family friend. This unique vase was made by artist Van Briggle in 1902. They're molded pieces. This one's particularly special. It's one of the earliest Lorelei designs, which features a woman in repose draped around the top of the vase. This is a standard bearing piece of American decorative ceramics from the arts and crafts Art Nouveau period. Artist Van Briggle was dying of tuberculosis when he designed the Lorelei vase, and the woman on the vase is seen as a tribute to his wife, Anna. This is a tribute piece. This piece is created out of his love for her. It's a, a woman in repose wrapped. The 1902 version is the most mature version of his work. The appraiser values the vase at auction between fifty and sixty thousand yeah. dollars. Well, that's impressive. Yeah. Well, believe me, it's uh, no small we'll thing. Take care of it. Yeah. The guest presented a porcelain bowl acquired by her mother, which is belonging to her great aunt. The appraiser noticed the mark on the piece, indicating it was from Noritake Art Deco. It was hand-painted in Japan for the American market. The bowl boasted an iridescent glaze, hand-painted flowers, and distinctive handles. The intricate design made it stand out as a beautiful Noritake piece. The assessed value for the item was... And at the top end of the spectrum here, you're probably looking at an insurance value of around fourteen or $1,500. So, just for that? Just oh for that! Gosh. What this guest thought was an ordinary vase turned out to be a lantern from the old Chinese empire. The lantern was a Christmas gift to the guest's grandmother in 1936 and was thought to be from the Chinese Sung Dynasty. The date was wrong, but it was close as it dates back to the 15th century when the Ming Dynasty ruled China. These types of pottery pieces are called celadons and were made in the Zhejiang province. The lantern was a small groove at the bottom marked with reddish clay, characteristic of the Zhejiang province. An oil lamp is placed in this groove to eliminate and cast beautiful shadows. The guest knew little about this, but now that she did, how much was this worth? The appraiser estimated the value of the lantern to be between four to six thousand dollars. I'm amazed. Keep it away from my cat. <laughs> yes, keep it away from the cat. According to the guest, it's been in the family since 1919. Her father asked the Buster Brown Company to send him a sign. Buster Brown and Tiggett are one of the most recognizable icons for shoes in the world. Buster Brown shoes are also part of the American iconic history, as far as shoes, but also in advertising. This is a really early piece. This is an early piece. You can see the face here, the way that the eyes pop out. I would definitely agree that this is from in and around the 1919 time period. It's lithography on thin plane that had been decaught in its original form. An incredible piece as far as advertising is involved. And at auction would fetch. I would estimate it in and around the five to 7,000 price range. Oh my but Lord. The guest brought American Indian stone artifacts to the show. He inherited from his grandfather. Stone artifacts were invented over 13,000 years ago by civilizations like the Clovis culture. They come in various shapes and sizes made from flint, chert, obsidian, and quartz. They have sharp-edged knives. Uniqueness are attached to their features, like weight, holes, color. These tools were vital for hunting, gathering, and food processing. Stone artifacts also played a crucial role in crafting wooden tools and pottery. The appraiser values it. These are sort of found everywhere, and they're usually $5 to $10 or something. And these celts here are around about sort of the $100 to $150 mark. This is a super little object here, and I think probably three to $400. Not good. Wow. Yeah. It's a wonderful little thing. It's a, the Popeye birdstone. Nice. 
Thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. The guest brought Herder Bros sideboard and table to the show. She inherited from her grandparent. The Herder Brothers crafted this remarkable sideboard and table. Their furniture was highly sought after by the elite of the era. Intricate woodwork and ornate hardware were hallmarks of their craftsmanship. Luxurious materials such as marble and gilt were incorporated into the designs. Symbolizing wealth and status during the Gilded Age, they were coveted by affluent clientele. Despite their lavish appearance, functionality was paramount in the designs. The sideboard stored dining essentials, while the table served as an elegant centerpiece. The appraiser values the furnitures. The sideboard and the library table today probably are worth $100,000 to $150,000. Oh, my gracious, sir. <laughs> well, my Aunt Anne would certainly be very proud of that, I'm sure. <laughs> it's remarkable, isn't it? Yes, it is. The guest brought concentric paintings to the show, he inherited from her parent. In 1967, this attributed painting by Alexander Calder surfaced, diverging from his sculptural au bois. He was born in Pennsylvania, United States, on July 22, 1898. This rare venture into two-dimensional art showcased Calder's versatility. This painting reflects Calder's abstract style. The bold, concentric circles and the bright colors gives the painting unique figure. The appraiser values the painting to be... I think if you were going to sell this in a retail gallery now, it... It might sell for about $50,000. <laughs> I'd say that was a good investment. That was a good investment. <laughs> it was. Egypt is a land rich in mystery and secrets. One such mystery was unraveled when this woman's great-grandfather's unearthed a canopy jar from the pyramids. It's in fact a canopic jar. Okay. And it's from Egypt. It's made of an indurated limestone. In ancient Egypt, canopy jars were essential in funerary rituals and were used to house the organs of the deceased. They usually come in sets of four and dedicated to Horus, and they're called the four sons of Horus, which also each represent the four points of the compass. This particular jar is one of a set of four. There'd be a human head, there'd be a jackal's head, there's a baboon's head, and there's a Horus's head. Adorned with a monkey head, this jar was called happy. Sometimes they're painted, sometimes they have hieroglyphs on the front of them, which tell you the name of the person and his status in life. It dates back to 750 to 350 BC, specifically intended to contain the lungs of the mummified individual. During the appraisal, the expert assessed the jar's value of $20,000. The woman's reaction suggested she may have expected a higher valuation. Okay. Ty Cobb gifted this baseball bat to the guest's father in exchange for a car in 1924. Ty Cobb is credited with inventing the cork grip technology featured on the bat, patented in 1914. Now, Ty Cobb was credited with inventing the cork grip technology. The bat was a Model 40K, specifically designed for professional players like Cobb. This is 34 inches in length, 38 ounces, and matches up to the records for Louisville Slugger for a Ty Cobb bat. The bat exhibited signs of use, including ball marks and cleat marks, indicating its game use status. It was remarkably well preserved, with no cracks, and the cork grip was still intact. The deep facilmi signature on the barrel added to its authenticity and value. Similar Ty Cobb game use bats are rare, making this particular bat highly desirable to collectors. At auction, its estimated value was fourteen to eighteen thousand dollars, reflecting its significance in baseball history. Wow, that is a big surprise. The guest arrived with the East Persian Balach rug. His aunt Dottie, the eldest, purchased this rug during her trip to Afghanistan. This Balach rug, identified by the left opening knots upon analysis, it originates specifically from the Burjan region. The unique aspect of this rug is the presence of large-scale birds in the design. Discovering it on a red background is remarkable, as it's typically seen in navy blue. It still retains its original salvage, but it has the patch. And this also has some areas of wear. At auction, it would easily retail in the $7,000 range. Wow. Very nice. 